So welcome everybody uh, to Kristen Green's dissertation defense. My name is Jim Leap. I am serving as the chair of her university oral examination committee. Uh, we are joined here today by the rest of the committee uh, by Nicole Ardouin and Larry Crowder, who are her co-advisors, and Rob Dunbar, the three of them from Stanford and very well known in the EIPER community. Also joined online um, by Anne Boudreau from the University of Washington, who will be the voice from the heavens and occasionally perhaps on screen. Um, so as you know, you know the drill, although it's a little bit different now because we are hybrid. There are people watching through uh, Zoom. And then of course, those of you here in the room, we will start with Kristen presenting her research, then have time for Q&A with this group and those online. When we close this open, this public session, we'll then go as a committee into closed session with Kristen for the final part of the examination. So do save up your questions. There will be time for questions before we finish. Um, but to take us into that, let me turn it over to Larry and Ann to introduce Kristen. Thank you, Jim. Um, so uh, those of you who have been following Kristen's work know that when she came to EIPER, she's made a deep dive into social science, but you may not know that she also made a deep dive into rockfish. And for her master's degree at, uh, at uh, Moss Landing Marine Laboratory, she spent as much time underwater talking to the rockfish as she did in Alaska talking to the people. Um, and in between those two events, she worked for a number of years for Alaska Fish and Game. So she's played the role of the scientific researcher, the role of the manager, and now the social scientific researcher. And so uh, as a, an exemplar of EIPER, I think Kristen's it uh, for somebody who's really mastered all those things. I met her through a previous EIPER student, Cassandra Brooks, uh, who were they, were, they were together at uh, Moss Landing Marine Laboratory. And it's been a real pleasure uh, to work with Kristen. I promise no embarrassing stories. But, but Anne may show some embarrassing pictures, we'll see. Uh, so welcome today uh, to hear Kristen's uh, dissertation and we're really excited about her work. Thank you. All right, can you all see that okay? Yes? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Anne Baudreau. Um, Associate Professor at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs at University of Washington. Um, and I really wish I could be there in person today. Um, but I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about Kristen from uh, a long time, uh, many years of collaboration that we've done together. And in particular, share with you what makes Kristen an amazing scholar, colleague, and friend. Um, and I also want to share some evidence of that Kristen is one tough Alaskan. Um, so tough Alaska moment number one, on our first trip to the Arctic, which you can see here, um, Kristen was on crutches with a broken foot, which did not deter her in any way from traversing the tundra and dirt roads. And I'm really glad Larry mentioned rockfish. I didn't even know he was gonna talk about that. Um, but I first met Kristen when we were both grad students in the mid 2000s, and then we reconnected in 2012 when she was working as a fisheries biologist and manager at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and I was a new faculty member at University of Alaska. Um, we co-mentored one of my graduate students together, and we shared a, a joy for scientific discovery and adventure on the water. Kristen is very salty. And tough Alaskan moment number two, um, on one of our research trips, Kristen hauled in more fish than anyone, including these very uh, lively and spiny rockfish. So I was really thrilled to continue working with Kristen um, as a close collaborator on her doctoral research. And we embarked on this very dynamic journey together, um, initially as co-PIs on a grant that funded her, her, part of her work. Um, but throughout this process, we experienced a lot of learning um, together through community engaged research. And Alaskans are not only tough, they're also very caring. And so caring Alaskan moment number three, Kristen uh, really centers community in her work and in her day-to-day -day life, from sharing fish, game, and berries that she's harvested to helping a neighbor in need. And I'm really excited for all of you to hear about the amazing work that she's done up in the Northwest Arctic. 
Um, so Kristen and I have supported each other through some very tough times and some very joyful times in both of our lives. Um, and her friendship and care for colleagues, friends, and community transcends geographic distances. So we've shared a lot of laughs over Zoom and in person, and we've commiserated and laughed over the seemingly mythical work-life balance. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> tough Alaskan moment number four, Kristen and her partner Monty uh, managed to have a baby during a pandemic, move multiple times, live in a dry cabin, subsist off the land while both are in school. So my hat is off to you, Kristen. <laughs> um, and so to conclude, Kristen is a wonderful teammate. I can't wait for many more years of working together. Um, and she's exactly who you want to be there when you need a kind, resourceful friend with plenty of grit. Uh, so finally, tough Alaskan moment number five. Um, this is Kristen helping me put chains on a very ill-equipped rental car that almost went off the edge of her driveway uh, during a late April snowstorm in Anchorage. So Kristen, I'm so proud of you. I, again, I really wish I could be there to celebrate with you, but I'm celebrating your successes from Seattle and uh, cheers to you and, and looking forward to the next time we get together. So with that, I will turn it back to Kristen. Well, thank you, Larry and Anne, for that wonderful introduction. I wouldn't have expected anything less. Thank you also to my committee members who are here today, Nicole and Rob, and my chair, Jim. And the title of my talk is Respect the Land, Pathways to Resource Stewardship and Resiliency in a Changing Arctic. And on that note, I wanted to first offer, offer a land acknowledgement to both the Miwek Maloney people, whose land Stanford sits on today, as well as where I live and work in Anchorage, the Dena'ina people. And I respect and honor the traditional homelands of these generations that have gone before me. And as Larry and Anne alluded to, before coming to Stanford, I, spent, I did spend six years managing commercial fisheries in Southeast Alaska. And there I realized three, uh, several things. Climate change was beginning to impact our fisheries, but we didn't have ways of adapting to that with our management. Fishermen also had important observations, both about climate change and other population trends, but I didn't have a good way of incorporating that into policy or management. This was frustrating to me, and it was extremely frustrating to the fishermen, and it led to a lot of conflict and mistrust, even though we had the common goal of managing sustainable fisheries. This led me to come to Stanford and pursue a PhD, and specifically these research themes of climate change, adaptation and resilience in resource stewardship. And to do that, I draw from a number of interdisciplinary fields and methods. Environmental anthropology, which is a study of how humans interact with the environment. Environmental sociology, which is how society interacts with the environment. I also draw upon adaptive governance, which is the study of flexible decision making with informal and formal governance institutions. And I draw upon community-based participatory research methods. And these are action oriented and strive to equitably involve the, the community at every step of the research process. And on that note, I wanted to first acknowledge all of my research collaborator, collaborators, both at Stanford, University of Alaska, and University of Washington, as well as the Alaska National Park Service and the native village of Kotzebue and Kivalina. I especially want to thank the hunters, fishers, and berry pickers in Kotzebue and Kivalina. They invited me into their homes. They shared their food and coffee with me. And most importantly, they entrusted me with their stories of harvesting, which are the foundation of this research. I also take a place-based approach to my research. My research takes place in and around Western Arctic National Park lands with Alaska Native subsistence harvesters, and I'll talk more about that later. But a place-based approach is person-centered, and it strives to focus on questions that are uh, important to a community's well-being. And these communities, Kivalina and Kotzebue, where I made over 10 trips over the past five years, are Arctic communities. They're indigenous. They're primarily in Yupiak communities. And Kotzebue, where it was minus three this morning, sits on the edge of the Kotzebue Sound, which has a brief ice-free summer season, but a much longer winter season. It's the regional hub for Northwest Alaska. It's a town of 3,000 people. And people there rely on what's called a cash a mixed subsistence cash economy. So there are uh, opportunities for formal wage labor, but they also rely on what they've hunted and harvested to supplement that. Kivalina is a 300-person village on the edge of the Chukchi Sea. And again, there's a, a 
brief ice-free summer season, but in the winter, the landscape op opens up and everything freezes because like Kotzebue, it's a, uh, there's no roads in or out. Kivalina and Kivalina, there are opportunities for formal employment, but people there rely much more heavily on uh, things they hunt and harvest for their, their lifestyle. In these Inupiaq communities, like many indigenous communities worldwide, uh, have close ties with the land and sea, and, but these are threatened by a number of factors. Most relevant to this dissertation are the impacts of climate change on the environment, as well as some of the less visible factors that have to do with a lack of recognition and respect for indigenous uh, rights. But there's much hope, indigenous knowledge, uh, innovations and in practices, behaviors and management demonstrate resilience and adaptation. And there's thriving examples of indigenous stewardship worldwide. Recent papers by Schuster et al. in 2019 show a higher proportion of vertebrate biodiversity on indigenous managed rather than, than non-indigenous managed lands. And a study by Fa et al. in 2020 shows a higher proportion of intact forest landscapes on indigenous managed lands than non-indigenous lands. And this background has led to my motive, overall motivating questions for this dissertation, which are how does climate-related warming in Northwest Arctic Alaska affect indigenous harvesters' access to coastal subsistence resources? And how can examining perspectives of indigenous harvesters and management staff facilitate resiliency and stewardship? And central to these questions is the idea of food sovereignty. And there's a formal definition for this by the Inuit Circumpolar Council, but I think this woman, uh, Hunter, that I interviewed embodies these values uh, really well in her quote. And she says, from the time that I can remember, my grandparents, uncles, and aunts would tell us, animals give their life to you. And if you take one, you honor it by using as much of it as you can. When I go hunting, I stop after I've harvested an animal and I think it in my mind or out loud. Then I start the process of harvesting with respect. And the way we're taught is the way we teach. And she goes on to say, as soon as you take me out of here, I feel like my soul starts shriveling. And if I eat a piece of native food from home, my soul gets rejuvenated just a little. And the more traditional foods I eat, the more I feel whole. And every piece of food I eat, I look at it and think of all the work that's gone into this piece that my children or children's children may not experience because the land is changing. Historically, Alaska natives have maintained food sovereignty through governing the land, plants, and animals, and developing reciprocal relationships with key species. And this harvest of subsistence or native foods, as this woman just talked about, is really important for physical and cultural sustenance. And I'm going to pause for a moment because I've mentioned the word subsistence a few times here, but I haven't told you what it is. It's a legal term in the state of Alaska. It's a customary or traditional use of wild resources for personal or family use, for food, fuel, shelter, clothing, technology, or transportation. In Northwest Alaska, people use up to 500 pounds per person year, per year, which is among the highest anywhere in Alaska. And that might not mean a lot, but to put that in context, that's as if every meal you ate, 30% of it was something you hunted, harvested, or gathered. But this Alaska Native sovereignty has been overlaid by the current federal and state management system. And today, for today, we're gonna to mostly be focusing on the federal system. And that necessitates a, re a review of some key land rights legislation acts. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, which Congress passed in 1971, and the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, which was passed in 1980. And INCSA, as it's called, extinguished Aboriginal title to the land and the management of hunting and harvesting. It also transferred land to Alaska Natives and compensated them for land claimed by the federal government. Inilka, took much of that uh, federally claimed land and designated as conservation units, including establishing much of the current Alaska parkland system. It also designated land use, and for parklands that meant, um, in most parklands, you can hunt or harvest under subsistence uh, priority. And I wanna note two things. One, that's really different than it is in the rest of the United States, where typically those activities are prohibited. And also that, this is uh, it established rural priority for subsistence, which is not the same as Alaska Native priorities. That means anybody who's a rural resident can hunt and harvest in um, parkland, in most parklands under those regulations. So MPS has a, a complex and important mission, um, which is to protect natural and cultural resources, which is especially important in Alaska, where it also needs to be able to maintain access to subsistence. And as I'm hopefully outlining for you, access to subsistence is interwoven with environmental, social, cultural, political, and economic factors. 
So to address this across my chapters, I rely on a theory of access, which is from a seminal paper by Rabot and Peluso in 2003. They define access as the ability to derive benefits from things and develop a number of categories that they posit are used to constrain or enable access. This includes things like markets, social relations, capital, knowledge, technology, authority, social identity, and labor. Access theory is also used to identify power relations. If you have a dog, you might understand that even though there's ample availability of food in your house, if your dog can't access that, it actually can't derive benefits from that food. And so there is some inherent power relations you might start to see in that relationship. But to give an uh, example that's more relevant to humans, if you're in the Bay Area, you might like to ski at Tahoe, but you're actually constrained or enabled by access theory in this. You need technology, you need access to skis uh, or a car to get there. You need capital to buy that car, to buy or rent those skis. And if you don't have either, either of those things, you might be relying on social relations or a friend or family to get a ride or to borrow equipment. And you also need knowledge. You need to know how to ski. You need to know how to get to Tahoe. So as a quick summary of how this is gonna look in my chapters, chapter one is primarily about a method for co-producing knowledge. So I'm gonna be focusing on uh, knowledge, social relations, and social identity, and looking at it in depth at some of these factors. In chapter two, this is a, uh, really about a framework for adaptation, and here I'm going to test all of these categories together and see how they uh, are relevant to adaptation in these indigenous communities. And then in chapter three, this is about applications to resource stewardship. So social relations, capital, knowledge, technology, authority, and labor are all relevant in this chapter. Chapter one, in Yupiak values in subsistence harvesting, applying the community voice method. This chapter was initially published as an article in Society and Natural Resources in 2019. And here I apply the community voice method. And this is a film-based community engagement method that's designed to advance conversation on management issues. And it's an iterative process with the community. So from project design, interviews, film production to sharing results, every step of the way, the community is involved. And we apply this in a novel way here with an indigenous community around to proactively identify emerging issues around natural resource management. And you might be used to sort of a methods results uh, discussion in the chapter. This, me this chapter is really about process. So it's, not, it's gonna be more about the timeline and process of these events. This, uh, this method occurred over three phases, and this is from a, um, coming in Norwood in, in 2012 design the community voice method. Uh, but there's first is the participatory discourse analysis phase, and that just means the study of human language as it applies to the human experience, and you'll see an example of that. Second is deliberation through film development, and third is reintegration and the outreach of that film um, into civil discourse. And this whole process took place over several years. Uh, the first phase was between June and December 2017. And this is where we apply my research question, which is what are indigenous or Nupiaq approaches to harvesting in Northwest Alaska? And to do this, I conducted semi-structured interviews with 40 subsistence harvesters from Kotzebue and 10 National Park Service staff. And the semi-structured interview is just you, ha you have a set uh, list of questions you're asking but you can also deviate from that to follow rich themes that come up in this conversation you're having with, um, with harvesters or, or staff. And then once I had all those interviews coded or, or transcribed, I coded them for themes, and these themes included indigenous values for harvest, and also this theme of des the desire for indigenous knowledge to be better understood by state or federal managers. And for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, this type of method, it basically looks like you have this transcript. I ask the person, are there traditional knowledge or traditional rules that you follow when you're doing ocean hunting or ocean harvesting? And this person says, well, you never get more than you need. And many people said something similar. And so this was coded as don't take more than you need. And then they go on to say, and then sharing everything you get, it says you're being responsible for that animal. So this is coded to share with others. So myself and the rest of our research team here came up with an initial 13 shared values, and these were work as a community, share with others, respect elders and other community members, do not waste, take only what you need, respect animals, be safe, give thanks, learn from your ancestors, practice prayer and spirituality, keep the place like you found it, know the rules of different places, 
and do not shoot the first caribou that cross the river, which is just a way of protecting the caribou leaders as they pass through the area. So the next phase is deliberation through film development. And that's where we held a community meeting in January 2018, and we brought them this list of uh, our initial shared values. And we said, did we get it right? And they said, not exactly. So <laughs> they, there's a lot of discussion and conversation. They, they merged some values. They changed um, how other ones were worded. And then together, they came up with this, uh, this list of nine values, which was work as a community, share with others, care for elders, and respect their knowledge, take only what you need, respect animals, be safe and prepared in the country, learn from your ancestors, give thanks to the spiritual creator, and respect the land. So after we presented these results and we had this discussion and they said, this is how it actually should be, uh, then we discussed the interest and focus of a short film. And we had several goals. We, initially, as our research team, we thought, well, we want to present this, uh, these, these values to other agency staff. And they said, yes, that's great, but we, we want them to be told through stories. We, this shouldn't be a list. And as a side note, if you want to copy the film, it's both available on YouTube and there's also um, jump drives here you can grab. But um, so, they, so that they, these values needed to be told through stories. And then uh, they also wanted this to be a starting point for a pairing of indigenous values and knowledge and resource management. And then third, we initially had a target audience of agency staff, but they said, that's, that's great, but we also want this to really be transmitted to community youth and make sure there's an intergenerational transfer of knowledge because some of that is, is changing and being lost. So we came up with three acts. They were what is subsistence and why it's important, nine shared values about subsistence harvesting, and then the connections of these values to subsistence management. And so now we're on to phase three, the reintegration of the civil discourse. And here we had a community meeting in June 2018, and we showed the, final, the film, we got some final edits, including getting some B-roll the community had filmed, which is another way of uh, including them in the process. And then we got further direction on film dissemination which included making sure we were co-teaching with an Inupiat elder in the classrooms. And so we planned to do that and develop the lesson plan. And overall, we showed the film to the communities of Kostibu, Kivalina, and Noatak. They're all in the Northwest Arctic and showed it to over 100 people there. And then with over 100 students in the Northwest Arctic, uh, Arctic Borough School District. We also shared the film with agency staff and university audiences as well as a broader public on YouTube. And then in a peer-reviewed manuscript, which we co-authored with, with Sikorik Whiting, a community member. And part of the community voice method is reflecting on your process and, and having reflexivity about yourself. And so some of our challenges were that we were newcomers to Inupiat culture. Uh, we were outsiders to the community. We initially included footage of musk oxen, which we thought was really great that we got this, and they said, well, this is a kind of a nuisance animal. Can you please take that out? Um, so we did. Um, we also, uh, with community representation, we, it's, it's hard to equitably uh, represent everyone in the community, and our process was biased towards community leaders. And then with this process, it's hard to know whether your collaboration will, how much social action it will result in. And that, process is ongoing as this film continues to be out there in the world. Some of our successes were that we engage frequently and we built a lot of trust through our repeated visits through all different seasons to the communities. Uh, we really tried to listen more than we talked and integrate people's insights. And we came back and shared our results with the community. So in summary for chapter one, shared values are important to reflect in decision making they can also, this particular process can inspire indigenous values um, in resource stewardship along the lines of other researchers who have done this as well. And the community voice method is one way of doing this. And the visual media uh, part of it really interwove well with the oral, oral storytelling tradition of, um, of Nupiat culture. On to chapter two, which again is a reminder is about a framework for adaptation this is climate change stressors and social ecological factors mediating access to subsistence resources in Arctic Alaska. This chapter was initially published at the paper in Ecology and Society in 2021. And when I first started my dissertation at Stanford, the Arctic was warming at twice the rate of global averages, which seemed really fast. 
And now it's actually warming at three times global averages, which makes it only the more urgent to study these impacts. And there are a suite of effects of climate warming in Arctic Alaska. And they're both positive and negative. We see pink salmon populations are actually increasing with warmer water temperatures. For caribou, we see increased vegetation, uh, which can increase access to food, but there's also winter icing events that can cause mass starvation when that's covered up. Marine mammals depend on sea ice for resting, breeding, pupping, but this is threatened by sea ice declines. There's also changes to the landscape and human access. This image shows sea ice extent in September 1984 versus September 2016. You can see a dramatic reduction in sea ice. This is potentially providing the opportunity for an ice-free Arctic shipping route. It's shorter, it's more economically advantageous. On a local level, lengthening uh, open water seasons are changing the way people travel to and from villages uh, and to hunt and harvest. Sometimes it's more unpredictable, un unpredictable and more dangerous as a result. And then we're also seeing permafrost degradation and coastal erosion, which are making previous travel routes impassable. My research question is, what, which of these climate stressors most impact access to and availability of coastal resources, and what factors facilitate or constrain this access? There's two dimensions of access in the study. One is that the physical stressor that causes the elimination, creation, enhancement, or disruption of routes to harvest resources. The second is as a mediating factor that affects our ability to derive benefits from things. And this is, again, just to flash up, this is where I'm really applying access theory is in this chapter. And to look at a conceptual framework of how this, that I developed for this community or this region, you have some sort of stressor in a community or individual. That stressor is gonna impact harvest access. And then there's gonna be a response. We don't know what it is yet, but likely there's gonna be some suite of mediating factors that are gonna mediate uh, the response to the climate stressor. There also could be a previous experience with a stressor that might influence that response. So if you're a coastal community that's experienced uh, lots of coastal flooding, maybe you put up a seawall to help mitigate that. To get at these questions, uh, again, I did semi-structured interviews with 59 subsistence harvesters, this time from Kotzebue and Kivalina, followed the same process that I described in chapter one. And I coded for themes. This time I was looking for changes in animal availability, stressors impacting harvesting access, and potential adaptations for, to these changes. And I also analyzed environmental data to see if the stressors that harvesters report were reporting agreed with quantitative environmental trends. So the first we're gonna look at changes in animal availability. This is a beautiful illustration that uh, graphic designer Cecil Howe made. And first, you can notice that anywhere there's a, a solid band is there's been no change in the harvest for that species. And there's actually quite a bit of stability. Uh, people harvest animals, plants and animals all year round. And, but there are a few species where there's been changes. Bearded seal, beluga, and salmon, chum salmon. And those arrows to the left are where there's been an expansion into an earlier harvest period of about two to three weeks. And that's correlated with sea ice retreat. Where there's a dash bar also indicates there's been a narrowing of that um, or, or, or a contraction on the other side. And so for bearded seal and beluga whale, those seasons have contracted as well as expanded. When we look at climate stressors, this figure shows each, each rectangle shows an individual harvester. Kotzebue is in blue, Kivalina is in red. And sea ice, weather, and coastal erosion are the top overall stressors that are reported. Uh, Kivalina tends to report mostly sea ice and weather. And when you compare these to the quantitative environmental trends for all of these, sea ice, weather, coastal erosion, high water, flooding, snow cover, and permafrost, and climate change is a little bit more nebulous. But these trends agree with the, uh, what you see in the quantitative environmental trend as well. We're gonna take a look at just one of these examples of sea ice decline and see how it plays out. So as a stressor, this causes a later freeze up and an earlier breakup of sea ice. Remember these communities are bordered by water, by, by ocean. And the impact is that it's harder to find marine mammals and travel safely. So we might wonder what mediating factors might help communities maintain access in spite of the stressor. First, we're gonna step back and look at everything as a whole. And so both Kotzebue and Kivalina reported capital, knowledge, technology, and social identity 100% of the time and social relations, time, and authority uh, at lesser extent, but still, still important. 
And some examples here for capital are things like transportation, so having a snow machine, a boat, and a four-wheeler or ATV. Uh, fuel, owning a land allotment where you might be able to have a fish camp. Hunting equipment. Knowledge includes family learning about harvesting, knowing about sea ice information and how to navigate that. Technology, again, includes transportation, using the internet for sea ice information, as well as social media to find out about harvesting locations. Social identity includes harvest rates to marine mammals and allotment ownership. So if you're Alaska Native, you have extensive ability to hunt marine mammals. Social relations includes sharing harvest and sharing of harvest costs. And time is something that I found in my studies. This is a new addition to access theory, but people talked a lot about having time away from their job, time to be flexible in their harvest, as something that constrained or enabled their ability to harvest. And then finally, authority includes things like harvester conflict with other harvester groups that are coming in that are competing for the same resource and exclusion of harvest through regulations. To give an example of how people talk about this, this couple says, well, we don't own a boat, so we have to borrow a boat or get a ride with somebody that's going. So here they're being excluded from access because they don't have a boat. Another man says, well, I had 15 gallons of extra seal oil and I send it to other folks. They share that with other folks, and so that's still how we do it. So his, his abundance of food allowed him to share with other people. And when we return to our conceptual framework and put these into our boxes, we can see um, sea ice decline, again, makes it harder to find marine mammals and travel safely. And things like capital, technology, and social relations might help a community or individual adapt instead of just cope or react. And when you're thinking about planning for a community, I wanted to point out something here. So these factors are a mix of asset and non-asset based mediating factors. So things like capital and technology inherently require financial capital, while knowledge, social identity, and social relations don't necessarily require, or it's, it's much more indirect. Time and authority have a mix of both. So it's important to, to think about it, consider a combination of these when you're thinking about adaptation. So in summary for chapter two, this provides a framework to identify and prioritize stressors for community adaptation. Sea ice, weather, and coastal erosion were most impactful in these communities. And we saw changes in chum, semen, chum salmon, beluga whale, and bearded seal harvest, which I'll start earlier. To adapt, it's important to support a combination of asset and non-asset based mechanisms over multiple time scales. And this might look like in the short term, people might need more access to boats or bigger boats in a bigger open water season. In the medium term, this might be more access to knowledge like open water safety education. In the long term, this might be pairing indigenous knowledge with flexible management policies to accommodate these changing seasons. Chapter three, applications to resource stewardship. And the title of this chapter is Pathways to Subsistence Management in Alaska National Parks, Perspectives of Harvesters and Agency Staff. This paper is currently in preparation And across the state of Alaska, there's many examples of how Alaska Natives have stewarded the land since time immemorial. There's examples of controlled burns in forest landscapes to inc increase new vegetation growth. Examples of salmon reciprocal relations to allow enough salmon to pass to refuge areas for future harvest. There's examples of groups that are conserving habitat and prey for marine mammals. And as I described earlier, earlier, preserving caribou migration by allowing the leaders to pass through unharmed. And as I mentioned in the introduction, this has been overlaid by the uh, contemporary uh, federal and state subsistence resource management system. And for the federal side, this includes a federal subsistence board, which is a decision making body. And then there's a number of agencies that are under that, including the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA Fisheries, and they all have different management jurisdictions. There's also ample opportunity for public participation. This includes subsistence resource commissions, which are the only one that's specific to the National Park Service. So these are joint uh, harvester agency stakeholder groups where, where harvesters can provide input. 
Regional advisory councils are statewide, they're by region, and again, it's an opportunity for harvesters to provide input and comment onto the federal subsistence process. And then there's working groups which tend to be species specific. So there's like a caribou working group where people get together to put input on um, caribou regulations. And then of course there's opportunity for informal interactions which is people coming into the agency office or calling them up and having a conversation. It's important to understand these overlapping and diverging perspectives because shared perspectives are shown to facilitate partnerships and participatory governance. Understanding the perspective of indigenous harvesters in particular can offer counterpoints to Western science and offer critiques or Western management theory and have been shown to galvanize resurgence in indigenous research stewardship. My research question here are what are National Park Service staff and harvester perspectives around natural resource management, specifically barriers to and solutions for improving subsistence management? This is really where I'm trying to get out the um, tension that I felt myself as a manager and really understand perspectives about management from multiple sides. In this chapter, again, I conducted semi-structured interviews with 59 subsistence harvesters from Kotzebue and Kivalina. And this time I interviewed National Park Service staff across the state who were involved with subsistence management. I also observed those subsistence resource commission meetings for three years and I conducted focus groups with members of the uh, SRCs. And then from all this data together, I coded for themes. And these included things like improving ideas for improving subsistence management and barriers to this, how local knowledge is used in management, and challenges in meeting harvesters' needs from National Park Service staff perspective. And there is actually quite a bit of overlap between harvesters and managers. I found six intersecting themes these included bridging indigenous Western knowledge systems, indigenous self-determination and sovereignty, addressing bureaucratic barriers, engaging the public in formal regulatory processes, enhancing community engagement and communication pathways, and protecting animal populations. And each one of these had overlap between the two groups uh, with, oh, with the exception of indigenous self-determination and sovereignty, which was mostly reported by harvesters. There's also a lot more details on this in the written uh, portion of my dissertation with overlapping percentages if you're interested. But I wanna point out that these, there's actually a scale to this. So many of these things are already happening. And to give an example of, of some of these themes that really just require some fine tuning within the current management system, themes like protecting animal populations, engaging the public in formal regulatory processes and enha enhancing community engagement and communication pathways are already occurring and people just had ideas for making this better. A second group are, theme, are themes that involve a cultural shift within National Park Service. And these were themes like bridging indigenous and Western knowledge and addressing bureaucratic barriers. And then finally, the theme of indigenous self-determination determination and sovereignty really requires more of a structural shift in society. And in the interest of time for today, I'm gonna to focus on just three of these themes and some of the cross-cutting solutions that are relevant. And the first cross-cutting solution is increasing, increasing local and indigenous hire of National Park Service staff. The second is enhancing outreach via regular visits to villages. And the third is advocating for indigenous sovereignty over resource stewardship. And someone gives an example of this, a harvester from Kotzebue says, well, having those people ingrained in our cultures, living amongst us, gives us an opportunity to communicate, get updates we can trust and believe because we know these people. So really this idea of, we wanna know who is managing, who's in these offices. Barriers to increasing local and indigenous hire of Park Service staff included filling out federal government applications, uh, hiring re requirements being too strict, uh, low wages and retention incentives. And solutions included recruiting more in local villages and having a local hiring preference, which again, National Park Service is already doing a lot of this, but there was a desire for, um, for some in increase in these areas. Training local people to meet job standards and creating permanent National Park Service staff positions in villages. And one of the National Park Service staff describes 
um, the importance of this. And she says, the park service is placing more value in attracting people that already have a sense of place to an area. They have the family connections. They have the connections to the community. You don't have to work necessarily to start building a basis of trust. These local indigenous hires are highly skilled people to begin with and can help us better manage these vast landscapes with a much more personal connection than anybody else in the region. So there are already a lot of recognition of this, the need and value for this. And then the cross-cutting solution of enhancing outreach in Alaska villages. Uh, this woman harvester describes, National Park Service could help cook. You could scale fish or hang fish, pick up trash and follow the boats that go out to check their nets and do seining. That's a good way to engage. It's a little bit different than most formal outreach you see from agencies, right? But this was repeated over and over. People really wanted Park Service staff and any, they wanted me to go out there and be part of their life, see what it was like to harvest in every season and be there side by side with them. Barriers to this included financial cost and time, weather delays and cancellation, disconnect and type of outreach. Uh, someone gave an example of getting boxes of regulations that they just used as firewood kindling because no one was there to explain how to uh, do, use those books. But a National Park Service staff really describes some of the, these real challenges of getting out to villages. And she says, although we administer as an agency from the regional hub, it requires us to travel in a single engine plane to get down to the villages. And with just the notoriously challenging weather, more often than not, cancels their flight or we get three quarters of the way and have to turn around and then need to switch to a telephone conservation, uh, conversation instead of meeting in person. So there are real challenges getting out to these mostly roadless areas in Alaska. Solutions here, again, included uh, creating permanent National Park Service staff and positions. You don't have to travel by plane if you're already there. Focus, again, a focus on in-person, inform, uh, informal rather than formal outreach. And then shifting priorities to better accommodate this time and cost of travel. And then finally, for the theme of indigenous self-determination, this uh, man describes who's a harvester from a fish camp I interviewed, he says, well, they should let the communities handle their hunting capabilities instead of trying to enforce like we're breaking the law. We're not trying to break the law. We're trying to provide for our families. And when you get these wildlife troopers up there harassing us, it makes it hard. And this theme of level enforcement conflicts with way of life was again repeated often. People are, want to go hunt opportunistically and uh, fill when they're uh, you know, this is how they've been grown up and, and taught and when they feel like these paper regulations are, are affecting this. People also describe conflict with other harvester groups, primarily uh, urban hunters coming in from Anchorage and hunting in these rural areas, as well as power asymmetries in the current system. Solutions people describe include over, just overall advocating for Alaska Native priority for subsistence harvest. And there's actually a movement to amend INCSA, that Land Rights Legislation Act I talked about in the beginning, to uh, provide for this. As well as identifying potential leverage points for shifting power, for example, contracting with the tribes for resource management. In summary, for chapter one, uh, harvesters and National Park Service staff actually share many common goals of building trust, partnership, and flexibility in management. Local indigenous hire, community engagement, and pairing indigenous, knowledge, indigenous and Western knowledge systems were described as some of the solutions. There is also a strong desire for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, and this is limited by some of the power asymmetries in the current management system. On to the findings and contributions. How's everybody doing? So going forward, this, these chapters in this dissertation provide at the base level empirical data on climate adaptation and resilience. Again, this is through methods for co-producing knowledge in the community voice method, a framework for adaptation that allows us a way to prioritize and identify stressors and think about ways we might adapt to those and providing opportunities for different pathways to resource stewardship. 
And throughout this dissertation, I strive to do this through centering indigenous perspectives. This figure by David Chavez and Gavin in 2018 shows a scale of different types of community participatory research. And I've striven to be more indigenous centered throughout the process. Certainly I've made mistakes along the way, but it's been a learning process for myself as well. And my hope is that overall this, by centering indigenous perspectives, but in being inclusive of many perspectives, this provides a more holistic approach to resource stewardship for the National Park Service, but also more broadly for all agencies. I wanted to play an audio clip, but given the complicated hybrid in person, that was gonna be an impossible option. Uh, but if you watch the film, you can hear this clip. But this uh, woman, Sikoric Whiting, she says, I think it's important for us to have that partnership in Western science and traditional science because we need each other. I think it's really important for us to just walk in each other's shoes and to accept each other and look at the strengths that we all have to offer so we can have a better product at the end. And at the end, the better product is always about land or fish or caribou. And we want to have that for generations to come. We are caretakers. We don't own it. Let's do a better job in taking care of that resource so our grandchildren can have it forever. And it's much more powerful when she says it. So I encourage you to listen to her words. But the sentiment here is that there's many pathways towards resource stewardship and they can happen in partnership and they can be inclusive and respectful and holistic. So the last bubble here is overall, I hope that this provides some societal shift in decolonizing approaches. And there's a abundance of wonderful literature and ways to learn about how to do this, which I've read for me personally, what I found this meant was listening more than I talked, partnering with community members and having specific mentors along the way, staying open-minded and reflexive, and centering indigenous perspectives, but using respectful language and approaches to everybody. And with that, I'll take any questions. Um, so we're going to, we're hybrid, of course. Oops, you can't see me. Um, so Kristen's just going to take questions directly for people who are in the room. I'll be watching the Q&A online, and I will also raise my hand with questions um, from that side. We're, we have a lot to cover, um, and we are pressed for time, but we're going to go a little bit over just so we have a chance actually to dig into a few, the many interesting things that Kristen covered uh, in this presentation. So I'll turn it to you, and then I'll raise my hand. Thank you, Jim. Um, no, I'll repeat the question. Okay. So I, if I can try to summarize your question, David wanted me to speak more to the uh, sort of, sort of the epistemolog epistemological differences between indigenous and Western knowledge, how that plays out in resource management or stewardship, and then any specific treaty rights between. Okay. So yeah, wonderful question and a complicated one. And what I heard from people is that there are these inherent uh, world views in these two knowledge systems. And one harvester I think described them as being two different, there, there is actually, there, there's an institution which we think of as the agency but the Inupiaq people are their own institution as well, and we don't always think of them as an institution, but the way he described it is that the only way it works is when those institutions are the same, when there's not the conflict between the two, um, which was a, a kind of a revelation moment for myself. And I think that's where some of the, um, the scholarship that's happened on pairing and bringing together of knowledges, not trying to slot in indigenous knowledge into Western management system, um, I think where that those approaches become really important. 
it's probably beyond the scope of this, my answer to be able to talk about or, or speak to all the differences, but I think, um, I, I think there are wonderful places of, of both knowledge systems. And um, the language I like to think about is that they're stronger when they're paired together and it, it gives a sort of a more, a more in a depth of perception. Um, Andrea Reed has some wonderful uh, scholarship on, on talking about the pairing and, and um, this concept of two-eyed seeing where when you have one eye that's looking with Western knowledge and another eye with indigenous knowledge, you, you're actually, you have a, a better view together. Um, so I guess that would be how you do that in practice in a management system, I think is a really hard question. It's one that I, I, I hope to answer in my dissertation and, then, and I actually, I didn't because I think the nuances of how you do that um, are things that happen through all these other pathways first, through building trust, through respectful communication, through outreach. Um, your second question was about indigenous sovereignty in Alaska. Um, there is a range of ways resources are managed in Alaska. There are, um, there's at least one example, um, a place called Annette Island in Alaska, where uh, they never gave up their land during that INCSA land rights legislation. So they actually, it's, it's sort of more of a reserve system. And in that case, the tribe does manage salmon fisheries themselves, and they have sovereignty over those salmon fisheries, all the way to um, the sort of the other spectrum of co-management, which is just completely top down. Um, I would say overall in Alaska, there are, there's always opportunities for participation. This, the amount of which that happens varies widely. Um, but there's also, there, there also are many sort of um, co-management type situations where there's intertribal working groups that um, have voting rights and things like that on management. So, so it's, a, it's a really big spectrum. Um, but other than the Annette Island example, I'm not aware of any area in Alaska where the tribes have complete sovereignty, if that kind of speaks to your question. Dick. It's a really, it's a, another great question. I think, well, the first step for me, which is sooner than three years, is to schedule um, a talk with National Park Service in Alaska. We've been, of course, communicating this whole time, but to be able to provide them um, a more in-depth view of especially some of these things in the third chapter, because there's actually a lot of, I presented on really broad level themes. There's actually a lot of specificity um, hundreds of suggestions that I have, lines of suggestions that I have documented that are um, uh, for, I think if I was an agency staff, they're pretty detailed and easier to implement than sort of how do you, than, than simply the, the command to pair indigenous and Western knowledge, I wouldn't know where to start with that. But if I have these sort of subset of details, I might be able to do something. So I think providing them with that information um, I don't work for the National Park Service, so I don't, I, my ability to follow up would be through external communication only. Um, certainly, I hope to work on the communities that I've been working in um, going forward. But I'm, I'm hoping that there's kind of a, a movement in general in science towards these decolonizing approaches, and that will provide a lot of momentum. Um, in the spring, I plan to go to the Kotzebue and Kivalina and do outreach with them and uh, with an, again with the National Park Service sooner than that. But I don't have like a three, five year plan my, personally to go there. Yeah, I, I think it will be up to the Park Service if, um, if that feels like something that they want to set a timeline for. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'm so curious about some salmon management throughout the Alaska, and the communities that are so wide don't necessarily comply with that treaty. How much did that happen, if at all? And is that particularly important? That's a great question. Uh, so she asked uh, Nick. Uh, Nick asked how if there was repeats in my interviews, or how and how the relationship changed over the years. There wasn't repeats with the formal interviews, 
There were people that were interviewed a second time for the film because we needed to um, get a specific segment on video. So we said, well, we'd really love, like what you said here really fits this value, but can, you, um, can we film you saying that basically? Uh, and so there, there wasn't other, other repeats other than that, but I would say that my relationship, especially with certain people that we ended up writing manuscripts with, they were people that I returned to on a number of occasions to be able to check in and say, okay, here's this paper we're writing. Do we, you know, did we get this right? So there was, there was a couple of key women, especially, that um, I connected with. And, um, and to be honest, you know, social media is really big in these villages. And so that was actually a really wonderful way of me being able to connect with people, even once the pandemic hit. Um, and so I was able to see what, what people were doing, and I'm, I'm probably friends with 20 people in the villages combined. And so, I don't know, that's been a really wonderful way of, of maintaining relationships. And I, I, that, that, I think, will continue to persist longer term. Jim. So I have a question from Sergio Sanchez Lopez. Is the NPS implementing some changes to be more inclusive, especially in states or parks where indigenous communities are the majority? Can you talk about some specific examples if you are aware of any of them? It's hard for me to speak to um, specific examples without working for the agency. I don't want to you know, misrepresent anything. Uh, so, yeah, I guess you repeated the question. I don't need to repeat it again. But, um, so I, so but, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to speak for the agency on any of that. I know that they certainly are committed to uh, local and indigenous hire. And so um, there, there are things like their hiring preferences that I started to mention are, are definitely out there. Um, and having Alaska Native community liaison uh, staff, both in Anchorage as a formal position. One of the women that we worked with in Kotzebue actually recently moved to Anchorage to uh, hold that position as a statewide uh, representative, um, but also in the, in the villages, in the, the field offices. So I think that focus there uh, and there's also things like uh, they do culture camps uh, with in different areas where they partner with uh, Alaska Natives to provide a space to pass on some of these harvesting practices. So those are a couple of ones I could speak to offhand. Gemma? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't include it in this presentation, but we, we did get feed, written feedback from the school district and, um, and from different agency staff. And the general feedback, it, it, I think people tend to be positive about that kind of thing. No one says, no thank you for making a video. <laughs> but, um, but so pe people generally like the ability to see um, or hear these stories of harvesting. And I think the one, one thing that I thought was really interesting or feedback that we did get was that when I heard from both, the, the video is primarily from Kots, it is all from Kotzebue harvesters. To me, I thought Kivalina harvesters said very similar things. But when we talked to the communities, they said, oh, we should each have our own set of values. And they're, they're actually doing that for things like caribou, they're by, village by village. And so as an outsider, I thought, gosh, these, these values, I think everyone's sort of saying the same thing, but they were very intentional about each having their own um, slightly different values, which have to do about knowing the rules for local places. And so I would say that was, um, you know, it would be, be, be great if that could go forward to communities. And then I guess the other feedback we got, we did um, gr uh, group interviews with young people, which was fantastic. But um, they said, when we first, we, they hadn't, they weren't part of the video, this was later, and they, we told them about the video, and they said, oh, cool. And then we said, it's 13 minutes, and they were horrified. And they said, well, can't you make shorter clips that are about each of these values that are like 30 seconds? And so that's when I felt really old. Um, but I think also, you know, if you had the right um, person who was motivated, you could make shorter clips. And that would be a great way, um, or based on feedback I heard. <laughs> OK, so I have another question online. And then maybe you make this the last question. Sure. And I know you have closing yeah. comments. Huh? So this is, oops, a couple more came in. But we're going to go okay. with this one. Jenny Selgrath, um, 
Could you talk about if your thesis is inspiring first part. Could you talk about examples of ways that people are adapting their indigenous practices to deal with the climate shifts you've discussed. Great question and appreciate that because I also didn't have time to chat about that today, but some specific examples are uh, so there's there's already some movement towards growing gardens in the area. That has uh, become more, uh, people talked about that more in interviews. Well, we'd have to grow a garden because we want to supplement our food. And the growing season is short there. <laughs> it is very short. But there's a lot of support for that. And so I think uh, adding to the sort of the knowledge and capital that would require to um, have the infrastructure to grow, to have a garden, at least in some part of the year, was one example. People also just described, well, we would just, we would sort of, we would find a way. Um, but I think the specifics of that is, is that people will tend to species switch to other species. So um, people talked about um, uh, she fish is a really popular fish people eat. And it seemed like before people were mostly harvesting them in, uh, in certain times of the year, more in the spring. And then they've always been there all year round. This wasn't a shift in season, but I think they've um, shifted to you know, doing more ice fishing and things like that for she fish. So, expanding to different species and then um, some people talked about moving <laughs> um, and and also but another more specific adaptation in the community was a movement towards a more pooling of harvest and pooling of harvest resources so it can cost a thousand dollars to go up river and get caribou by the time i mean fuel is super expensive there and so people i think are moving towards combining trips to go together to get caribou rather than just going with their own family, um, which is kind of a return to you know, some of the maybe um, ancestral traditions of, of doing group beluga drives and things like that. OK, I have a few acknowledgment slides. Of course, I want to thank my funders, the National Park Service, Ocean Alaska Science and Learning Center as well as the Stanford University, Emmett, Price, Buckley, McGee, Leverson, and collaboration grants. Between all of these, my research was completely funded, which was, um, will be indebted for to these people for. I started my talk thanking Kotzebue and Kivalina, and I want to finish thanking them again, uh, but with special thanks to Secoric Whiting for uh, the many times I heard her voice in person or in my head throughout the course of this dissertation, it really shaped my community-based practice ideals. I want to thank Karina Kramer for the many of the beautiful photos she provided, uh, as well as Maya Lucan and Hannah Atkinson with Ware Parklands for providing so much of the logistic and mentorship um, support in those communities. Stanford colleagues and friends, we have wonderful EIPER staff. They provide so much support for all the students are an, an, and are a wonderful advocate for the students. My particular cohort, uh, which we've called the best cohort that ever was and ever will be. <laughs> there might be some debate about that, but I think it's true. As well as um, specific other EIPER students, past and present, who have really been influential in my personal work. My dissertation group, many of which are here today, some of which have gone on to graduate, has been a group that I've met with every single week just about since um, my PhD started. And they have provided input on the most terrible drafts you've ever seen and made them so much better. And I can't thank them enough for their constructive feedback. Um, Savannah Fletcher was my partner in, in uh, the collaboration grant. That uh, was uh, my, chap my first chapter. And she's in Alaska now, and she's been wonderful to work with. Uh, the Crowder Lab and the Social Ecology Lab, also a wonderful safe space to share research and hear about others', re others research as well. And then uh, my friends here in the Bay Area who help support me. My advisors, Nicole Ardoin, you inspire me to do my most academically rigorous work. And you always ask the big research questions which are hard to answer sometimes, but they've made my research so much better. I will always think about the questions of power and privilege <laughs> from, I think, one of our first conversations. So thank you for that and for providing such key insight all along the way. I really admire you as a researcher. Larry, your care for your students is so palpable. And you are able to provide 
academic advice in a way that comes across as a friendly chat and then suddenly I realize that I've gotten this great nugget of wisdom and I thought we were just having lunch together. <laughs> and, um, your, yeah, your acumen with respect to my research questions has always been right on and you've always been there as a pillar point for me to check in with at a moment's notice um, for a personal and professional decision. So thank you so much for being part of my PhD. Jim? <laughs> Internet, last minute. <laughs> I think it's a nice picture. Um, Whenever we meet, I always leave feeling just more confident and more, I, I just feel like I have this clear pathway forward and you have this way of giving um, input when I have a question that it, it's just like I have my marching orders and I only wish we would have had more opportunities um, to meet in person because of the pandemic and thank you for being such a professional and warm chair through these two meetings. Rav, I can't think about you, this is actually a picture of our sophomore college Alaska course. I can't think about you without teaching in Alaska. So I, I, I co-taught with Rob uh, for two field courses in Alaska. Um, and he really, that, that's where I learned how to teach from was those classes. And I still have these wonderful relationships with students because you took me on there. And uh, Rob, I feel like really understands deeply how important my work in Alaska is because he's, it's important to him too. And, um, and I've learned, I really appreciate all that I learned from you and how to teach and interact with students because Rob walks in the room and undergrads just light up. And if I could bottle that up, I would be, um, I would have my teaching career set for me. And then finally, Anne, who um, can't be here today in person, but has been a partner from the very beginning of my PhD. Actually, even before my PhD started, we co-wrote the grant from the National Park Service that funded my research. As you saw, she helped me navigate the bumpy streets of Costa View. We um, had many opportunities to share cramped bug houses where we converted desks to beds and figured out how to, um, um, what shortly meant in um, harvester speak, which we figured out was about 20 minutes. <laughs> it gave us 20 minutes to get ready for an interview. And um, Anne has been um, oh, just an incredible committee member this, throughout my dissertation and provided such thoughtful and conscientious comments on my writing my talks and provided emotional encouragement along the way. So thank you so much, Anne. My family, my dad is able to be here today. The rest of my family is virtual, uh, and the, as well as the Kaufman, Frampton, and Worthington families. I love you all so much, and you believed in me from the beginning from this PhD and provided me with delicious food and helped me move a number of times. And, um, really, your, um, particularly my, my family, their attention to education from a young age really is what allowed me to be here today. My partner, Monty, has enabled me to uh, search for novelty both in life as well as in my research and has been able to make me feel successful throughout all the ups and downs of a PhD. He's a wonderful father to our son um, and a wonderful partner to me. And, a huge part of this dissertation is due to his support. My son, Henricus, and if this serves to inspire him in any way, then I will consider myself lucky. And I hope for him and his generation, um, resilience in a changing climate. Thank you. Thank all of you for being here.